Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. I want to thank you for joining me. Again, I want to say to you that uh, I'm not doing this for visual effect on a, on a video on YouTube. Um, I just want to get this message out there to as many people as we possibly can, so I just want to lay it down somehow. You can listen to it. Just read your Bible. This is a new series of teachings that I'm doing, and as, and as you have noticed, I will be doing a lot of different series of teachings. Uh, I would like to have thousands, literally, of hours of teaching that we eventually do. Uh, some of it will be television format. Some of it will just be like this. We just want to get the information out to you as quickly as we possibly can because of the needs of the people. I've been ministering in some capacity for 35 years. I've uh, had the privilege of working in helps ministry in every kind of helps ministry you can think of, uh, working in the church, working in children's church, nursery, literally, um, cleaning the floors of the church, being the janitor of the church, teaching in church, uh, being deacons, elders in the church. My wife and I have done a youth. Uh, you, you can pretty much name it. And we started that way. And then uh, eventually we got into full-time ministry, pastored our first church, established churches, many churches we've established over the years. I say established, not planted. We continue to work with the pastors and leaders to encourage them to get a good foundation laid. Now we're doing mission work all over the world. Uh, and uh, establishing churches all over in foreign lands and, and different things like that. Been on media ministries and television and radio and all these type of things for years and years and years. Um, and I pastor pastors and leaders and say, ask me questions. And a lot of the questions that I uh, they have asked me over the years continue to come up. So I'm going to take the, the number one questions that are asked in counseling and just talking and sharing with other ministers and, and share with you what I've learned about it over the years. I certainly don't want to come off as a know-it-all because I don't feel that way. I'm not a know-it-all. In fact, to be honest with you, if I was a know-it-all, I wouldn't be wearing these glasses because these glasses look pretty corny. But, I, you know, I've got a small print Bible here. I just picked these up so you'll just have to uh, chuckle as I go along with me because it looks pretty funny. But anyway, um, I'm not a know-it-all. But you can't. Uh, be successful, and, and that's a term that I use simply because other people use it for us. You can't be successful in doing certain things for 35 years, seeing that they work right and correctly, and uh, uh, you know, and all that without learning something. So I kind of feel, I guess you could say, like I have something to share. We know that 1,500 uh, pastors or more are falling out of ministry every year. This, uh, this is a sad thing in America. We, we also realize it's across the world, across the board. We, we realize that people who want to help people, who love people, want to counsel people, minister to people, disciple people, whatever the case may be, finding it very, very difficult to do so. Many of them are experiencing burnout, uh, experiencing anxiety. And so, uh, you know, because of that, I want to make these, these things available. I've learned over the years some valuable lessons, and I wanted to share them with you. And so, thus, thus, we'll take these questions and we'll talk about them as we go. And this is the first session. So, uh, the first question that comes up a lot is, uh, it, it's not really uh, asked as a question as much as it is maybe a conversation that develops, but how do you deal with people or problem people all the time? Many people get stressed out. They they, uh, they they realize very quickly in this day and age that people have a lot of baggage, that they're very needy, that when they come over into the church, they uh, have way, weird ways of believing. Their minds are controlled to a certain extent by the world system and even demonic forces sometimes. We, we, we see people do some of the most ludicrous things, even spirit-filled Christians. <laughs> And, you know, it's real interesting. I don't have time to, to go into it, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I will read to you uh, out of the Amplified Bible. It says, But understand this, that in the last days will come set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. So the Word of God really uh, expresses, and my, uh, uh, one of my, the guys that I just love to listen to, his name is Rick Renner. I would encourage all of you to read his books listen to his, he does videos like I do. Um, great man of God who uh, is an apostle uh, in, uh, you know, over in the for, for Soviet Union areas of Europe. And uh, I, I got to tell you, 
he says on this scripture that the uh, that the Greek uh, tenses and stuff here that are used are, are talking about you know the last of the last days as we as we head toward the coming of Jesus the you know the winding up of everything he, this is what he's talking about he says every year almost there will be an added amount of stress it'll be hard to deal with and hard to bear the good news about that and then and then after, as if you read down through second uh, Timothy chapter 3 excuse me I'll get back to my point in a minute but if you go down through second Timothy chapter 3 which we're not going to do today you'll see the manifestation of how people are well those people when they get saved that are like that are coming over into the church and so we we you know there's a lot of baggies a lot of flesh a lot of weird ways of thinking and so unfortunately for us you know uh, uh we have to deal with that however the good news is is that god understands we he'll give us grace to deal with it i, I find that we have grace to deal with these things however the number one reason i think people get stressed out uh, when, when it comes to dealing with people is a misunderstanding of a misunderstanding of what we can and cannot do and a misunderstanding of what we should and should not do in trying to help people. And uh, I've learned over the years the Word of God is very clear about some of these things. As an example, and if I take a drink of some water every once in a while, it's just my way, as an example, and I'm going to talk to you just like you're sitting here, uh, right across from me, and uh, I've got to tell you, over the years, I've learned something, and that's this. In Matthew chapter 13, if you'll turn over there, Matthew chapter 13, and we could go to, Ma to Mark chapter 4, of course, the great parable of the sower. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4 that... Um, all other principles concerning the kingdom of God work off of this principle. I'm paraphrasing, but everything is connected to this principle. The sower sows the word, remember? And so as a sower or a preacher or a minister or one who writes articles or whatever it is you're doing for God, writes books, who writes articles, who blogs, there's a thousand different things people do nowadays. You need to understand you are a sower and the sower sows the word. Our responsibility is to sow the word. But I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 13, let's just go down through here. Verse 1, the same day when Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, a great multitude were gathered together unto him, so that he went to a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them, parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds uh, fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some fell among stony places where they had much, not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they, they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, there were scorched, and because they had no root, they were withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell unto good ground and brought forth some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirtyfold, who has ears to hear. And his disciples came to him and said, Why are you speaking in parables? And he said, Because it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of, of, of heaven, but to them it's not given. For, for whoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever has not, from him shall be taken away that which he has. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because seeing, notice this, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in, the, in them it is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Least at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Now listen. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away which was sown in his heart. This is what this is he who which who which receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed into the stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and on with joy receives it, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arise because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also receives seed among the thorns, as he that hears the word, the cares of this world, 
the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit, brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now, there's been many ministers over the year who, who unfortunately have have taught this like he's just talking about people getting saved here. Certainly, that could be applied, but he's not just saying that. Every time that we have a church service, as an example, even the time that I'm sharing right now, uh, I am sowing to a group of people that are listening to me who have different types of soil in their heart or their heart soil. Now, you might have a hard heart. You might have a good heart. You might have a heart right now where the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches is choking the word. The heart is very important to understand in this principle because, of course, the word of God, God will back up his word. But it has to be planted in the right type of soil. Now, pastors have asked me for years, this is very frustrating because I see so little fruit out of the people and I see so little uh, happening in their lives. And sometimes, you know, we can we can be around the, the, the uh, uh, church world for literally years and years and years. And you can see somebody who's been sitting in churches, even good churches, many, many years. 20, 30 years, and see very little spiritual growth. What's the problem? Well, Jesus told us right here. Jesus said, it doesn't make any difference. You can be the best sower, I'm paraphrasing. You can be the best sower of the word of God there is. You can be Jesus himself, who was the best. But because of the hearts of the people that you're going to be dealing with in this world, only one out of four of them that hear the word will actually allow that word process to come into their lives the right way. I'm just paraphrasing. The seed will grow and will bring forth fruit, some uh, uh, 30, 60, or 100 fold. Only one out of four. You'll get two out of four, half, that will bear fruit some of the time. But only one out of four will do it for the rest of their lives because it's a hard issue. Now, people have asked me many, many times about this, and I just got to tell you, pastors and leaders, you have to learn something. Our responsibility, Paul told to young Timothy, preach the word. Didn't say, preach religious traditions, man-made doctrines, uh, your denominational bent, or your own opinions. That's bad. You can do that, and you'll mingle the seed, and, and you'll be part of the, the problem in your own church and your own ministry. But if you're doing your, your very best to preach the uncompromising word of God to the people as best you know, none of us are perfect, as best you know to rightly divide it, then you are going to be an excellent minister of the gospel if one out of four people actually becomes something special in the kingdom of God for the duration. Now, I know that sounds difficult, it's it almost it sounds to some people almost negative, uh, but it doesn't make any difference how it sounds. Jesus told us that was a fact. That was what was going to happen. I tell young preachers and ministers, listen, your responsibility is not to change people. One of the hardest things, and and this is I'm answering your questions. Hopefully, slowly here we'll do it slowly. One of the most difficult and challenging things I ever had to learn in ministry or anybody will ever have to learn in ministry is that you do not have the power to change somebody else's life. Only Jesus can do that, and Jesus does that through the Word of God when people will receive it in a good heart, when they'll want it, when they'll desire it, and when they'll apply it. There's very little that we can do in life except give them principles from the Word of God to cause them to receive it and change. The only thing we can do is preach the Word of God and pray appropriately for them because by prayer and preaching the Word of God, you can get to their hearts, keep their hearts to a certain extent, teach them to pray. But the truth is, one out of four. So I just look at people now when they ask me this question and I say, this is just ministry. You have to learn that you cannot change some people. Even God himself cannot, listen to me now, cannot 
You say, well, what do you mean cannot? God is almighty. He can do anything. Yes, we all know that. But he will not override the principles of his word. He's a covenant God, works on covenant principles, and he will not override somebody's free will or somebody's, you know, hard heart. He'll do everything he can to minister to them by influencing them, but he will not override that. When they make a choice to do what they're going to do, even God himself cannot, because they will not open their heart up to him, help them. So why should you think that your responsibility is somehow to change people, you see? Now, I had to learn that, because when I first got into ministry early on, I, for some reason, I don't know what, if it was just me or, or maybe just my thinking, I somehow took on the idea that it was my responsibility to work with people no matter how long, no matter how much, uh, how goofed up they were, or how much they were resistant to what I said, because somehow I thought, I suppose, in my heart of hearts, that I had the ability and the power to change them. And I found out very quickly in ministry, I do not have that ability. Only God Almighty does. And it's only if they'll yield to him. My responsibility as a minister and a sower stops there. When I get up on Sunday, as an example, or I'm done today here, it is no longer my responsibility to do anything about what I just said, except to make sure what I said is accurate according to the word of God as best I can and delivered in a way as best I can to be received. When it goes out there, my responsibility stops. It's up to God to confirm his word with signs following, and it's up to the people's hearts to receive it and make the changes. God is able to deliver anybody from, a, uh, from anything. I deal with some of the most difficult, challenging situations you ever heard of. I deal with it constantly. I've done it for years. I deal with people that have been abused, hurt, mistreated in ways that would make the hair on the back of your head stand up if I even started talking about it. I deal with people coming out. I deal with people that were demonized, demon-possessed, and literally uh, raised in ways that it was almost like the Adams family. Uh, it is the worst possible situations you could ever hear. And yet I see many of those people take the word of God and apply it and change very quickly, becoming stalwart Christians and overcoming all of their problems and issues. Not through years of counseling, ladies and gentlemen, but through applying the principles of the Word of God. Nothing wrong with counseling if you're doing it in light of the Word of God. But what I'm saying, I've seen people go to psychiatrists for 20, 30 years. I've seen people doing all of this, and none of that really has much impact. But when people take the Word of God into a good heart, no matter how goofed up they are, they can be set free. Now, we all know this, but you also have to understand there are people that you'll be dealing with, there's people that I deal with all the time, where they come into my life, I give everybody a chance. We should give everybody a chance if they're sincere. But it's very easy for me at this particular time in my life, probably because of experience, probably because simply you just learn things over a period of time. Uh, you know, all of us have to learn this. I remember when I first got into ministry and I would have people call me on the telephone and they would go on and on and on for hours about their issues. Now, I'm willing to listen to people. I'm willing to hear what they have to say. I'm willing to be a good listener and give them the information that they need to make changes. But I'm not willing to do that for the rest of their life if all they're doing is getting information from me, which is good information that they could take and change and never do anything with it. I know that some, to some people who've been taught in the denominational world and some Bible schools and cemeteries, I mean seminaries, you have been taught that, you know, you just need to work with these people no matter what. But the Bible is very clear, very clear that there's many people amongst the church world that are problem people. And problem people are simply people that, for one reason or another, never change. They come to church, they sit there, they may have uh, all the Christian jargon, 
They can praise God, some of them with the best of them. They can shout and run around the building. But if you do not see growth and you are constantly, they're constantly calling you on the telephone, showing up at your office with the same issues, the same problems, the same emotional responses, and they're never taking the word of God and never really applying it, they will drain you and your battery will be drained to the very end of its life. And this is where a lot of burnout comes because for some reason, pastors especially are very merciful people. And we need to have mercy, but we also need to have wisdom. I found that when I'm preaching the word of God, my responsibility is to deliver it to them again, the best I can. That's draining enough. The anointing comes, we put it out there, but then my responsibility stops. If they have a question about it, I'm willing to answer it, sure. If they're, if they're making progress, I'll work with them and I'll continue to work with them as long as I'm seeing progress. But when all it is, is, a, is another session on the telephone of draining, another session of asking questions, the same problems over and over and over again, and there is no change, you have to draw back and you have to realize something. That if there is no change, something's wrong in here, right? And there's nothing you can do about it except for pray for them. Now, I know that's very difficult for many people to understand. Some of them may think that I'm being harsh or cruel or mean, but I'm not being harsh or cruel or mean. I would rather take the energy I have that is limited, the time that I have that is limited, and focus on those who are receiving and changing. I would rather have 50 people in my congregation that are really the 30, 60, or 100 fold people than 300 that aren't. Most pastors don't think that way. This is one of the reasons they're so stressed out. Many people and pastors and leaders over the world are accumulating large crowds by compromise. Jesus never told us to do that. He's not interested in people just coming to church, having church, and just hearing the gospel message one time. He's interested in people hearing the gospel message and then hearing the word of God, the kingdom message, which is a message of change and a message of bearing fruit. Large congregations, and there's many tremendously great large congregations that do a fantastic job. In fact, uh, the new statistic out is a little bit scary. The average uh, church size in America today now is 35. It was 78 a few years ago, but now it's about half that. So if you got over 35 people, you got one of the larger churches in America right now. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? So it's a sad statistic. But here's the truth. Many, many large churches, what we call, you know, real big churches, 200 or more, um, in America, many of those churches are literally filled with people that are would fall into the category uh, uh, that are not ever bearing or just a few are bearing 36 year or 100 fold. Let me ask you a question. In the, in the long term run of things, Jesus told us to make disciples. He didn't tell us just to you know preach the gospel and, and, and people to receive salvation and then just for them to just sit there and do nothing. But you see folks, this is why when you read the Bible very carefully and, you, and, you, and you're very careful at, at, at you see who he's talking to, Jesus spent more time with his disciples. He told them, your hearts are hearing, your eyes are seeing, your ears are hearing, your hearts are hearing. And it's for you to hear and know the mysteries of the kingdom. You see, to whom much is given, there's, there, to, to, you know, much more will be given. Even a little bit's given to them. Because if you got a good heart, you get a little bit, you're going to get more. If you're teachable, you're going to get more. So I always tell people, number one, this is important. Secondarily, when you're dealing with people, and I want you to turn to first, first Peter chapter 5, you're going to have to learn to deal with them scripturally. Because people bring problems, or at least the knowledge of problems. And many of these things that people bring when they talk to you, when they share with you, when they open their hearts to you, 
are literally things that are hard to bear and hard to deal with. No question about it. Second Timothy tells us that. How do you deal with these things? Well, I, turned, I, I learned a long time ago that if I didn't deal with them appropriately, it would affect me, affect my marriage, affect my ministry. I would have never made it 35 years, and I would not be able to make it today the rest of the time that I have on this planet if I didn't learn this one principle. In 1 Peter chapter 5, God gives us a little teaching that is so powerful that it changed my life forever. I learned this very early. And I can tell you, because I learned this very early in life, I learned how to do this. My life has been so awesome when it comes to dealing with stress, anxiety, concerns, worries. I've learned, praise God, to put it into God's hands. Now, everybody knows that. We all talk about it. But really doing that is a whole different ballgame. I really believe for ministers and preachers, this is probably one of the very most important things you can learn. Not only do you need to learn that you can't help everybody, it doesn't mean you don't love people and you don't try, but you just learn there's certain individuals that, you, that, that just are not receiving, so why put all the energy into them? You're going to have to cut some of that off. First Peter chapter 5, though, out of the Amplified Bible, verse 1, I warn and counsel the elders among you, the pastors and spiritual guides of the church, as fellow elder, as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a share in the glory, the honor, and the splendor that is to be revealed, disclosed, and unfolded. Tend, nurture, guard, guide, and, the, and fold the flock of God that is your responsibility, not by coercion or uh, constraint, but willingly, not... Uh, dishonorably, motivated by advantage and profits, belonging to the office, but eagerly and cheerfully, not domineering in arrogant, dictatorial, and overbearing per as overbearing persons over those in your charge, but being examples, patterns, models of Christian living to the flock and congregation. And then when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will win the conqueror's crown of glory. Now, now notice this. Likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank be subject to the elders, the ministers, the spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. Clothe, apron yourselves, all of you, with humility, as the garb of a servant, so that the covering cannot possibly be stripped from you with the freedom from the price and arrogance towards one another. For God sets himself against the proud and insolent and overbearing and disdainful and presumptuous the boasters, and he opposes, frustrates, and defeats them, but gives grace, favor, blessing to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God in due time and that he may exalt you. Now, how do we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? He's going to tell us. Verse 7, casting the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, all of your worries, all of your concerns, once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that the enemy of yours, the devil, roams about around like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize and to devour. Apparently, the enemy can seize and devour those who don't do this. Withstand him, how? Be firm in faith against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined, knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brother, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. Now, I want you to notice verse 7, because out of the Amplified Bible, it correctly uh, interprets this the way that it really is, is meant. Casting the whole of your care, whatever care, personally comes upon you. Whatever care you hear that comes upon somebody else you're ministering to, all of your anxieties, any anxiety that comes to you personally or any anxiety that comes from, that, uh, that, that you see about another person that you're dealing with, all of your worries, not some, all of them, all of them, all your concerns once and for all on him. Now, folks, somebody says, that's impossible to do. No, it's not. It's not impossible to do. I've been doing it for years. People say, Pastor Thomas, sometimes it just seems like you don't care. You're right. It's not my responsibility to pay my bills. 
when, when, when I look at the finances and I see that we have an off week or something, I don't freak out about it. That's not my responsibility. I'm not the one who started this ministry. God did. I cast, I pray about it. I just say to the Lord, Lord, you know what we need. And I cast the care of it over on him. I don't, and if it tries to come to my mind, folks, I learned a long time ago, I do not allow those anxieties, those worries, those concerns into my mind. Now, if you're going to think somehow that you're going to have to answer every question every person has, <laughs> and you're going to have to somehow come up with, with and meet all their needs, and somehow you, you take on their needs as yours over here, you know, in a counseling session somewhere or in your church, you're going to find out you're going to go crazy. This is why people are falling out of ministry. I mean, it becomes overwhelming. The second that something like that is said to me, because I do love people, and you do too, you have to make sure you take it to, to God in prayer, casting that over on the Lord. Because let me tell you something. God's watching over you, and God's watching over them. There's really only limited things we can do. Sometimes we must act to meet a need. I understand that. But if we acted every time somebody tugged on our heartstrings and somebody asked us about this and, 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 and their world is crashing over here, folks, there's only so much you can do. We are not called to take burdens and cares and anxiety on ourselves from problems in our own life our ministry, or other people. When I was a young man and I first got into ministry, it almost destroyed my marriage because I would bring the problems home. I learned very quickly, I will not do that. I cast them on the Lord, and when they try to come back, I fight the good fight of faith. That's exactly what he says to do here. You have to fight the fight of faith. You got to keep those cares, those anxieties, those things that make you care, have anxiety, worries about other yourself, other people, whatever, over on the Lord. Well, Pastor Tom, I, I don't think I could do that. You could do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, and we just need to appropriate the Word of God. I hope that helps some of you. How do you deal with problem people? You deal with them the best you can. You give them the information that can change their life through the Word of God. You pray for them. But that's where your responsibility stops. Till next time, God bless you.